Praise the Lord, everybody. I said, praise the Lord, everybody. I'm going to say it one more time for the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord, everybody. Who's got something to thank God for today? How many of you had an attack of the devil this week? But we're going to let the Lord know that everything belongs to him and there is nothing that the enemy can do that can take our praise. Amen? Amen. So I dare you to praise him like you have lost your ever-loving mind. Because you know in the end, we win. Somebody say, we, we, we win. Touch your neighbor, say, we win. Regardless of what the, what the doctor said. Regardless what the bill collector said. Regardless of what your boss says, we win. Because who has everything? I dare you to point to the Lord and say, you are excellent. Somebody say, you are excellent. And that's what we are going to sing today. We're going to ask that the youth choir give us some help. And I dare you, I dare you to praise him like you have lost your mind. I dare you to give the victory to the Lord. I dare you. I dare you. I dare you. Oh 
time, he has taught, preached, and evangelized on all seven continents. He has served as editor of Message Magazine yes. at the Review and Herald Publishing Association. He has served as an associate director of the LNG White Estate at the General Conference and then became the administrator and professor at Loma Linda University and Loma Linda Medical Center, followed that by being president of Oakwood University, for which he served for 14 years, during which the time the institution advanced to university status. So it's under his leadership that Oakwood became a university in 2008, amen? Dr. Baker is a graduate of Oakwood University and Andrews University, Howard University, and has done postdoctoral training at Harvard University and Boston University. He has degrees in history, theology, administration, and organizational communication, and holds postdoctorate certifications in educational management, emotional intelligence, and executive leadership coaching. He's the author of more than 15 books and the recipient of numerous awards and citations from the church community and federal organizations that include NASA, Space Flight Center, the Redstone Arsenal, and the White House. As one of the vice presidents of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists since 2010, Dr. Baker's GC leadership portfolio includes publishing ministries, health ministries, and public affairs and religious liberty. He chairs several boards and is one of the chairman of the General Conference Executive Leadership Summit and provides leadership development training for the world field. Dr. Baker recently coordinated the successful great controversy, the Great Hope Global Distribution Program that distributed more than 142 million copies during 2012 and 2013 around the world. With the General Conference and Religious Liberty Leadership, Dr. Baker helped to develop the global strategy that under God recently resulted in the release of Adventist pastor Antonio Montero from prison. Amen. By way of hobbies, Dr. Baker enjoys exercising, uh, mountain climbing, and running marathons. Um, he has ran, I believe, in 36 of the 50 states, and it is goal to run in all 50 states. Amen. He runs marathons 26.2 miles on all seven world continents and the North Pole one of only 100 persons on record to have accomplished this feat. Just recently, he completed the Iowa Marathon, which means he has now run a marathon, I just said, at 36 of 50 United States. While running marathons at Oakwood University President, he modeled healthful living and raised more than $500,000 for student scholarships in the Oakwood University Running for Scholarship program. Dr. Baker is married to Dr. Susan Baker, a physical therapist and health educator, and the Bakers have three adult sons and three grandchildren. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Baker while a student at Oakwood University. And in that time, in our, in our relationship, the time that I got to know him, he became someone that imparted life lessons to me. He became somewhat of a mentor. And I appreciate him for that. But during that time, what stood out most to me about Dr. Baker was his hard work and dedication to the mission of Oakwood University. They said he worked harder than anybody else on that campus, often beginning his days at 2 in the morning, working well into the day. And so we praise God for the vision that God has placed him. He's a leader, and we pray God, praise God for his hand on his life and the example that he has been to so many people. And so after um, the special music by the choir today, the next voice we'll be here will be that of Dr. Delbert Baker. Hear ye him. Amen. Amen.
director uh, and I like her shoes that's it that's it that's it on this youth day I'd like to direct your attention to a passage in the book of Luke Luke chapter 23 and I want to read a few verses in your hearing An account that only appears in the book of Luke. When many people read this account, they wonder, wouldn't it have been a good idea if maybe Matthew had made comments about it, or Mark, or John? But it's only in the book of Luke, and at first glance, one would think it's rather cryptic. They would think that the details are scant, Maybe there's not much to this account, but I assure you, my young brothers and sisters and all of us, by the time we end this morning, you will see this passage in a fresh and new way. Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. Uh, let me go back to verse 32 to give the context. Luke says, and two others also who were criminals being led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they were doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves, and the people stood looking looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, saying, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse or accusations at him, saying, Aren't you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal answered, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, truly, or assuredly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. I'd like you to take and go with me your attention to AD 30 on that fateful Passover Friday on Calvary. And if there's one thing that characterizes that event, it is the word confusion. It was a time of mass confusion. For they had apprehended Jesus just a few hours before, maybe some six, seven hours before this event on Calvary. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas betrayed him. And he was led from the garden, and he then went through six different trials in which he was arrested first three trials before the religious leaders until they trumped up a charge against him, and then from there they went to the Roman leaders. First to Pilate, and then to Herod, and then to Pilate. All of this was taking its tax and toil on Jesus. He was worn out. He was tired. He was fatigued. And on top of that, they scourged him three times, at least twice, and then they turned and beat him and spit on him at least twice. And then after Pilate had said six different times, recorded in the book of Luke, I find no fault in this man. There is nothing wrong with this man. He is innocent. I find nothing to accuse him for. Then he 
because of the pressure put on him by the Jews, turned and said, have him, you may crucify him. It was the most heinous and justice case that we have ever seen. It was the uh, tra travesty of justice. It was the absolute act of turning justice on its head. And Jesus, the Bible said, took all of this without a word. And then they placed the cross on his shoulders and they marched him through Jerusalem on the way called the Via Dolorosa. And there he was going to the city and he was mocked and sneered and talked about by the people. And you know the story, when he's coming closer in, uh, Jesus is staggering under the load of the cross. He can't carry it. It's too much for him. And he staggers on the load. Ellen White says in The Desire of Ages that he, twi he tried twice to carry the load, but it was too much for him. And then we see this black man from Africa come on the scene. Some people say it was coincidence, but I call it providence. It was no accident that Simon was there. It was no accident that Christ, at that very moment, collapses in front of Simon. And, and they, the Roman guards, they look around at someone. They couldn't choose a Jew because the Jew would have no part of it because they didn't want to be defiled on the Passover. So they see this man of color. They see him coming in from the country. And the Bible says they, they compelled him. They called upon him to help Christ with the cross. And Ellen White gives us the details. She says that at that time, Simon didn't know much about Jesus, but she says that something miraculous happened when Simon helped Jesus with his cross. Something happens when we do service for Jesus. She says he took that cross on his shoulders and he was never the same after that. She says that was the point in which it was the conversion in his life. And he helps Christ carry the cross to Golgotha in the Hebrew tongue, or Calvary in Latin, the place of the skull. And here they are. And there they lay him down to the ground, and they put the nails in his feet and his hands. Somebody says, how do we know that's true? They, it didn't say that they nailed him, but Jesus later, when he appeared to the disciples, he said, look at the nail prints your hand in the very place where they tacked me to the cross and nailed me to the cross. So they lift him to the cross. Now, you must know that Jesus, even though we often talk about him being the one who was crucified, he was crucified with three, three different people were crucified at that time, two thieves and Jesus. He wasn't the only one. And everything that he went through, they went through. They nailed him, they nailed them to the cross, the two criminals, like they nailed Christ to the cross. The problem was, they hadn't gone through what Jesus had gone through, and the big difference was, Jesus were, was innocent and they were criminals. They were the companions, they were the, the colleagues of Barabbas who was freed. And he was released, but these two criminals were confined to die by the cross. And here we see their... They come to the cross and, 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 and all the crowds around him and, and there's mass confusion. They're, they're wagging their tongues. They're, they're spitting at him. They're calling him names. They're shouting at him. And there's confusion there. Everybody has it wrong. They're saying, you are the Christ. Save yourself. You are the king. If you're a king, then use your kingly power and come down. The irony of the cross is so, there were so many ironies around the cross at that time. In fact, he was in fact the king, but this was not his kingdom. He had the power, but he didn't use his power. They said, save yourself. He could have saved himself, but if he had saved himself, all of them would have been damned to hell. It was in the midst of all of this that we see this confusion. Nobody had it right. This was the Passover. This was the time when the Jews were about to offer the sacrificial lamb. And yet the lamb of God himself was on the cross. Even his followers, those who at a distance were looking on, who knew Jesus, uh, they, they doubted. And, and Ellen White says they were mumbling, mumbling to themselves saying, here was the man that we placed everything on. He was the one we counted on, and now he is dying? They could not believe it. There was, there was, they just didn't get it. 
And I say to my young brothers and sisters today, and if I entitled my message, there was one man who got it. One man got it. Only one. Out of that whole throng there, out of the whole group, everyone going to the cross, once they got there, and even at the cross, there was only one man that got it. And he leaves his testimony in these few words in Luke chapter 23. He got it. Let's pray. Father, we simply ask that you might open our eyes as we look at your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, the thief, the two thieves. The Bible says, if you look, take it and look at 23, it says in verse 32, there were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. That's verse 32. And then turning over, it says in verse 39, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Now, there were two criminals. And yet it says here, and one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. Now, a lot of people believe that the, the criminal, the one, the thief on the cross who turned to Christ and said these words to him, they figured that he was one who didn't rebuke Christ. But I want to share you something very interesting. If you will look in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 44, and in Mark chapter 15 and verse 52, it says in, that pa in those passages that they both cursed Christ. Not just one. They both cursed Christ. They were with the mob, and you would think that when they were being excruciated, they were being tortured there on the tree, that they would have no energy for, for cursing or talking about Jesus. But that was the frenzy that took over the people there. It, it, was, it was demonically inspired, and they were caught up, and everybody was shouting, and everybody was spitting, and everybody was calling out these negative things against Jesus. Confusion. Nobody had it right. Nobody got it. Nobody had it right. They were shouting at him, but then something happened that one of the thieves went quiet. Went quiet. The other one continued, but one thief went quiet. You say, well, what happened before that? Jesus, if you look in verse 40, 34, said, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking at what happened there. And who was this thief? We're told that Barabbas, the revolutionary, was notorious in his day. And these thieves and him had gone on a rampage. They were against the Romans. They murdered people. They extorted people. And they, they would rob people, take the money, and use for their revolution. They were in cohorts, and, and, and they, they, they were about overthrowing Rome, and they knew about Jesus. They had heard about Jesus, but they were not moved by his words. They wanted to take it by force. That was their plan. We will take it by force. And they didn't believe in Jesus anyway because he was speaking about love, and he was speaking about a world to come and a kingdom to come. They wanted it now. That's what they wanted. And so here around the cross... We see confusion reigning. The priests, who were supposed to be the very representatives of God, they were speaking negative things about Christ, cursing him, laughing at him, mocking at his so-called power. His believers were standing back, doubting and wondering. The Roman soldiers, even they took part in it. They started offering him uh, the vinegar and, and the drink. All of them were playing in this charade of, if you're a king, you're a king. Here's your kingdom. You have these two thieves on both sides of you. Do something if you're a king. And Jesus is saying nothing, and he's watching all of this. And then, and then the silence is broken. As the thief, one of the criminals, continues to shout at Christ, if you're the Christ, save yourselves. And then it says in verse 40, and the other answering rebuked him. Now here it is, this, this colleague who was once cursing Christ with his friend, something happens 
He changes and he begins to turn against the friend that he once was with. What has happened? I declare unto you, my brothers and sisters, it was a divine miracle, a transformation of this man's life that turned him around. The only thing I can liken it to was the case of Paul on the Damascus Road, and he, he, had the pa- he had the papers in hand, the authority to kill the Christians in Damascus, and he's on his way to Damascus, and the Bible says he's struck, slammed on the road by a power from heaven, and God has him groveling in the dust, and then he recognizes that God is God. Some conversions are dramatic, not all, but some are, and this one was. The conversion of the thief on the cross was as dramatic as anything you'll see. One moment he's cursing, and the next moment he's been changed. Something about that made him to get it. He got it. He got the significance of what was happening. And my simple message to the young people today is when you When you end this message, I hope that you get it. That as you go in society around, as you go to your schools, as you go to your homes, other people around you may be missing the whole point. They may be caught up in a flurry of pleasure and activities and wasting their substances and getting high and fooling around. But you get it. Something about your mind and something about your connection with God allows you to go deeper and you get the significance of what's happening in the world what's happening around you. He got it. He got it. He got it. You say, well, how do you know he got it? And what what about this makes you think that he got it? Because of what he says. Because what he says, this man is there on the cross, and as he's cursing and as he's talking, something happened. He he hears, he sees, he listens, and, and something begins to come through. This is not a normal trial. This is not a normal person on the cross next to him. Something about this man is different. Begins to grow silent. They're they're talking about him, and he's not saying anything. And then, in the midst of all of this mockery, and these people are literally seeking to kill the Son of God, he calls out and he says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. I mean, what love, what what majesty, what what power that can rise against all the opposition. And he takes the high ground and he says, forgive them, Father. And the thief hears this. And the curses that he was sending forth, he begins to pause and to stop and to think and says, there's something different about what we've got here. And the Bible says, when his friend was blaspheming, He turns to him and he says this. And in these words that he says here in verse 40 following, we see the proof of the evidence that this thief was truly converted. He was convicted and it showed that he got the significance of that moment on Calvary. He was the only one that said words of hope to Christ during this whole encounter. I like to give Simon credit because Simon was the man who helped him with the cross. But Simon didn't say anything. There was no words recorded in the scriptures. Uh, The ones, the ladies who were coming behind him, the daughters of Jerusalem, who are not followers of Christ. And and when they were moaning and crying and and, and just kind of sorrowing for Christ, he turned to them and said, don't sympathize me. Think about yourself because a time is coming. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. A time is coming when you will need all the sympathy you can get. So no one said anything but this man, this thief on the cross. So as he says, we see here the evidence of true conversion. It's when the one criminal was sending forth blaspheme, and he's on one side of Christ, turning to Christ, speaking to him, and just cursing him and laughing at him. In verse 40, we see the first evidence of conversion. It says, uh, but the other, the other thief or criminal answers and he rebuked him. It's a Greek word which means with great force and great courage, he says, why are you doing this? I I thought about my my young brothers and sisters and about how it is sometimes it's very difficult to stand for your faith. A lot of times when you're keeping the Sabbath holy and you are doing the right thing and you don't do certain things, people look at you and say, why do you do that? And you feel like maybe you ought to be quiet. But in this case, we have the example of he rose up. He was not ashamed of Jesus. And he said, this is why I believe. And it says he rebuked his friend who was cursing God. 
stood up with courage. He says he rebuked him with energy, with power. He says he rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God? That's the first sign of conversion. When a person is converted, they have, they have in their heart a fear of God. They recognize that it's not only this life, it's not only a man or a woman, but they're thinking about hell to come. They want to avoid hell, and they want to gain heaven, if we wouldn't even say amen. So there's a fear of God. He says, don't you fear God? I mean, isn't there anything in your heart or mind that would suggest to you that you ought not say these negative things about the God, this man? Can't you see there's something special about this man? I imagine the, his companion said, what got into you? <laughs> Here you were cursing with me, and now what happened be, since you've been nailed on that cross? But he was changed. That's what happened. He was touched by the power of God. And as a result of that, he was changed, and now his speech is different, and he defends God and his word and his truth because he's been changed inside. Now he's got a fear of God. He's got a respect for God. He's got a reverence for God. He's got a fear of doing things wrong because he doesn't want hell, and he wants heaven. So he says to him, he rebukes him, saying, do you not even fear God? But then next we see, beyond that, it says, do not fear God, seeing that you're under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly. He then had a sense of his sin. It says, justly, for we deserve the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing. He's got a sense of the fact that I have done wrong, and that's basic to salvation. You've got to recognize that I have fallen short of the glory of God. I am sinful. I am, I am evil. I have urges that are not right, and I, and I recognize this. I'm not denying this. I accept this fact. But this man, Christ, has done nothing. So he sees his own sinfulness, but he also sees the sinlessness of Jesus. He says, this man is just. In fact, uh, the, the context here, the words are saying, this man, I, I don't know really what it was. Ellen White says that, that really what had happened was this man had listened to all the trial, all the hearings. He had been in the background. They were there in the background when Christ was being accused. They heard nothing uh, brought against the man. None of the witnesses could make a case against him. They listened to this. They, they were receiving all this in. And whereas one wasn't moved by it, the other one said, nothing has been found wrong with this man. Ellen White says further that the the man remembered stories. He remembered the healings of Christ. He remembered the fact that Jesus had done these good works all through Israel. And all this came back to his mind. It was convicting him that this man was pure. So first we see he has the fear of God, but then we see after that that he's got a sense of his sinfulness and Christ's sinlessness. But then it says beyond that, he says... Then he said to Jesus, and I love this, I love this. Then he said to Jesus, uh, the word is Jesus, it means Savior. He says to Jesus, he's actually referring to him as his Lord. You, you see the transformation, not only did he fear God, not only do you have a sense of his sinfulness, but now he recognizes Jesus as his Savior. He says, not simply, a, not someone hanging on the cross, he saw through the, Cal the Calvary and the crucifixion, and he saw that this man on the cross for him. Somehow through the, the torture of crucifixion, and even though we know the pain, the pain of a crucifixion could actually almost make you unconscious, somehow know that the Spirit of God was able to move in the mind of this man. He was able to see through the, the pain and all the torture he was going through and see that salvation was right next to him. There's a lady by the name of Barbara Brown Taylor who wrote a book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. It's quite popular now, and she talks about how that Christians are, are into what she calls solar Christianity. Solar, solar Christianity. They, they only want to serve God when things are light. They only want to serve things when things are bright and happy and joy. And when you call somebody into the faith, you say, come to Jesus, and he'll give you peace and happiness, and, and you'll be happy all the time. But that's not necessarily so. What Jesus does is he forgives you of your sins, and he gives you the assurance of eternal life and the assurance that hell is not your destination, but heaven is. And Barbara brings out that she says that what we need to do is start dealing with a lunar spirituality, meaning uh, moon at night, that we can even serve God when it's dark. 
when things are bad, when things are down, when you don't have the money and you don't have the answers and you have the problems, but in spite of all of this, you see hope beyond the problems. And even in the midst of problems, you have faith. That's real Christianity. At this time, the thief wasn't, asked to, he wasn't asking to get off the cross. He wasn't saying, Lord, take me off the cross. If you really love me, take me off the cross. No, no. He said, Savior. Savior. He knew that he was dying and he should die. And he knew that Christ was dying as well. But he saw beyond the problem. One of the, young, one of the things that young people deal with often is, is the issue of if they will follow delayed gratification. In other words, that means you want to delay doing something that you want to do for the greater good later on. Uh, somebody comes along, some sweet-talking brother or some nice-looking girl comes and says, if you love me, you'll do whatever I want to do. If you love me, you'll show your love toward me. But delayed gratification says, I don't want to do that now. I want to wait till marriage. That's still in, isn't it? That's, that's still, we still believe in virginity and holding off and waiting for... Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Somebody ought to say amen. 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 Parents should encourage it. Amen. Young people should stand for it. That I don't believe in immorality. I don't believe in wasting my body with drugs and alcohol and uh, things that are negative and destroying to me. I will delay my gratification because I have a power and I have a heaven I'm moving toward. And even though it may be hard right now, I know the greater good is coming down the line. So he looked at him. He said, Savior, Savior, Jesus, Savior, Jesus, he says in verse, in verse 42. Before that, he was talking to the thief. He was talking to his friend. He was rebuking him, saying, this man has done no wrong. We've done wrong. We're getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. Don't you fear God? He said, I have developed a fear of God in my heart. I, I recognize that what's happening here is something special. But he said, then he says, he turns to Jesus and turns away from his colleague, and they're looking across Jesus. The thief is talking to Jesus. He leans forward and he looks over the thief and he says, why are you doing this? Jesus is witnessing the conversation between them. He's between the two thieves. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, Jesus, Savior, Lord, the, the owner of my life. Then he says, remember me. Remember me. Oh, that's, that's a powerful statement. What was he saying? He was saying that even though you are on the cross and even though you are down and out, you have no power, it seems like you are powerless, I believe that you are powerful. And even though it may not seem like you're winning right now, I know that ultimately you are going to be victorious. I mean, this thief had some good theology. His Christology was right. He knew that Jesus was the Passover lamb. He understood that. His ecclesiology was right. He said, I know that if I'm one of your followers, you will be with me, and I can be with your body and your church, so remember me. His eschatology was right too. Because he said, when you come to your kingdom, meaning your kingdom's not right now. All these people around the cross, they just didn't get it. They were confused. They thought he was coming now. He was setting up a temporal kingdom uh, to do away with the Romans and to establish the Jews. The thief got it. He understood that the kingdom wasn't now. It was down the line. He even understood the resurrection. You say, well, how do you know that? How can you read that into it? Well, he said, when you get to your kingdom, he knew he wasn't doing it right then. He knew Jesus was going to die. And in fact, Matthew brings out that the scribes and Pharisees said they mocked Christ at the, at the cross and said, you said three days, you go in the belly of the well and you'll come forth. Well, then prove it right now, come forth. Come on down from the cross. So they had made resurrection a topic of their derision. The thief heard it. And he got it. He understood that the resurrection was not now. Somehow or another, in his darkened tortured mind, he understood that Jesus was the Passover lamb. And he had to die. And when he died, he would be resurrected. 
And he was going to glory. And the thief said, when you go to glory, remember me. Don't forget me. Oh, what a, what a message. What a powerful sermon on the cross. Nobody else was saying it, but that man got it. That man got it. That man got it. And I say to my brothers and sisters and all of you, all of us, do we get it? I mean, can we go through difficult times and are we really delaying it for that glory to come? Or are we getting weary? Are we just kind of dropping our guard, saying, well, you know, things aren't really the way it is. We've got a tough society around us. The pressure is so great and things are shifting and changing now. But he didn't. He got it. Remember me, he said. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. You will die. There will be difficult times. Uh, you will go through trials and tribulations. But I know glory is coming down the line, he says. Remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he had it right. Well, he was basically saying, he, and the steps are clear, he recognized the fact he feared God. He understood that. He recognized that he was a sinner and Christ was sinless. Then he says, I understand, my Lord, he says, I understand that you are righteous and I want your righteousness, so I want to be a part of your group, so remember me. So he says, even down the line, he's looking beyond the moment to eternal life. He sees that eternal life is to come. He's not asking for an immediate blessing. Can you serve God if you don't get an immediate blessing? I mean, he could have said, well, listen, Lord, the only way I'm going to serve you, serve you is if you get me off this cross. I mean, I want, to, I want release from this problem. You know, I've been praying about this thing. I've been fasting about it. And now's my moment. Get me off the cross and I'll follow you. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. He said, I can stand the cross. Because I see beyond the moment. I see this glory. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then I want to close my comments by looking at what Jesus said. Jesus stops dying. He said, Jesus said, I hear he is, he's got this weight of the world on his, on his, on his shoulders. And Ellen White says, in just a moment, we see there's going to be darkness over all the land. At, the, at 12 noon, everything goes dark. There's an earthquake. Uh, that's when the veil is ripped and twined. Jesus is at the final point, taking the sins of the world. He stops dying. Stops dying. And he turns to that thief. He says to him, truly, truly. He said, why did he say that? Truly. Why did he say truly? Because he said, what I'm about ready to tell you is so fantastic, you will not be able to believe it. It is so good. It is so, it is so powerful. It is so potent. that I'm going to tell you this, and it's going to blow your mind. But I'm telling you for the truth. What I'm saying to you is true. You may not feel it. You may not see it. But it's true. He says, truly, I say to you. I'm telling you right now, even when that's what he means when he said today. That's where the comma goes after today. He says, I'm telling you right now on the cross, even as I'm dying, in the midst of this terrible situation, I am telling you, I promise you, he says, truly, you will be with me in paradise. Oh, man, just you'll be with me. Now, he didn't simply say you will be in paradise. He said, you're going to be with me. I will be, heaven is not going to heaven. Heaven is being with Jesus. Jesus understood that. The man said, remember me, that he was really saying, I want to be with you. He wasn't necessarily talking about heaven. Then he's a kingdom when you're in the kingdom. He wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted some quality time with Jesus. He didn't have time. He didn't exercise the opportunity when he was alive to be with Jesus. He said, but remember me, I want to be. And Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth, you'll be with me. He got it. He got it. He got it. The thief got it. The, man, the boy got it. He's like a homeless man on the streets. He's like a thug. He's like a, a gangster. Comes in the church, and you're looking at him all funny, smelling funny, and looking funny, and people are wondering about him, but he got it. He understood the principle that if I can connect with this man, I got eternal life. tell you, you'll be with me. He stops dying. 
a lot of Christians, some Christians, they struggle with, am I really saved? You know, they, they really wonder about that. They say, you know, I, I understand, I read what the Bible says, and, you know, but I just wonder, if, is it really true? And, they, and, and God gives us the word, he says, we ought to have faith and believe, but sometimes we struggle with that. Just think if Jesus could come to you and say, I'm telling you right now, you will be saved. You're going to be in glory. But Ellen White says that though it may seem very hard for us to believe that when we accept Christ sincerely as our personal Savior, as surely as he meant it to the thief on the cross, so he means it to you. He's saying to you, I'm telling you right now, you accept me, salvation's yours. You'll be with me. You will be with me. Now, there's a big space. There may be a long time between now and then, but if you'll just be faithful, you'll be with me. You get me? You'll be with me. He got it. He got it. He got the concept. He got it. It was clear in his mind. He said, you'll be with me in paradise. What is that word paradise? It's an old Persian word. It means garden. Paradise, you know, the book of Revelation talks about the uh, paradise being in the kingdom of God. He says, you will be with me in the kingdom of God. I will give you glory. I will give you eternal life. I will give you a new body. I will transform you. You're on the cross right now, but a time is coming when it all will be changed thief got it. As I close, I ask you today, do you get it? Or will you get it? Will you believe? Will you simply say in simple faith, yes, Lord, what you say, whatever it is, I will accept it. Regardless of your condition, regardless of what it is now, or regardless how you want it to change, regardless of what happens, you're willing to trust God and to put everything in his care like that thief who got it. Do you believe that? Or do you have to have things rosy and nice and all good and wonderful and peace and happiness? My brothers and sisters, God did not promise us peace and happiness on this earth. He did say in the earth to come, but not necessarily in this earth. You may have it and I want it. I'm not putting it down. But it may be that God says you've got to go through tough times. You may be praying for that healing. I may not heal you the way you want to, but I'm still with you. I will give you the strength you need to go through it. Be strong. I will be with you, he says. I will be with you. What a marvelous word Jesus gives to the thief on the cross. He tells him, I will give you eternal life. You will spend glory with me. And right then and there, Jesus assured him that everything he said in the word, the Old Testament, everything he was promising them would be true. And the thief, from every indication, has believed it, and he As Ellen White so eloquently puts it in Desire of Ages, he will be in heaven. He received the gift of eternal life. Now, that's hard for some folks to take because this this guy was like the prodigal. He he was down and out. He was a bad guy. And it's like the father running to the prodigal son, kissing him, putting the robe around him. For legalists, that's hard to say because the legalists would say, well, listen, uh, if they were Jesus, they'd say, well, I, I will save you, but you don't have enough time to do good works. You can't earn it, so I don't know if I can give it to you now. Or if you're a Catholic, you might say, well, you got to go through purgatory first to be sure. But Jesus sidestep all of that. He simply says, I promise you, I will give you your word. The man got it. This reminds me of a story that took place some years ago in the dead of winter in the city of Cincinnati. A young lady, only 22 years of age, she died at the commercial hospital. The record goes that she could have had an easy life. She had been beautiful. She had skills, talented, talented. And as she said, she was flattered and sought for the charm of her face, but she chose not to follow the way of God. She fell into sin, lived a life of prostitution, drug abuse, and whereas once she had been the pride of her parents, well-educated, she fell into a terrible life of sin and degradation. She wanted to do her own thing. She gave in to sin and Satan, and she died brokenhearted, friendless, and among her few personal belongings was the manuscript to 
the poem that was called Beautiful Snow. Thomas Buchanan Reed, the great poet and writer, found this piece and was so moved by it that he followed the casket of this young woman to her graveside. It's a long poem, but I'll just give you a few of the verses. She says, Oh, the snow, the beautiful snow, filling the sky and the earth below, over the housetops, over the street, over the heads of the people you meet, dancing, flirting, skimming along, beautiful snow, it can do no wrong. Flying to kiss a fair lady's cheek, clinging to lips and frolics and freaks. Beautiful snow from the heaven above, pure as an angel and gentle as love. Once I was pure as the snow, but no more. Fell like the snowflakes from heaven to hell. Fell to be trampled as filth in the street. Fell to be scoffed, to be spit on and beat. Pleading, cursing, dreading to die. Selling my soul to whoever would buy. Dealing in shame for a morsel of bread, hating the living and fearing the dead. Merciful God, have I fallen so low, and yet I was once like the beautiful snow. God and myself, have I been lost by my fall? The various wrench that goes shriving by will make a wide sweep lest I wander too nigh. For all that is on or about me I know, there's nothing that's pure but the beautiful snow. How strange it should be that this beautiful snow should fall on a sinner with nowhere to go. How strange it would be when the night comes again if the snow and the ice struck my desperate brain. Fainting, freezing, and dying alone, too wicked for prayer, too weak for a moan. To be heard in the crash of a crazy town, gone wild and mad in the joy of the snow coming down. To lie and to die in my terrible woe with a bed and shroud of the beautiful snow. A terrible poem that shows in really pathetic and emotional tones the, the end of a person without Christ. Mm. That's Mercy. what happened to this woman. Mercy. It, doesn't happen to any of, it doesn't have to happen to any of us. Because sometimes later, a Christian got that poem and he added this verse, these two verses to that. And he put filthy and black as the old trampled snow, sinner despair not, Christ stoopeth low. To rescue the soul that is lost in its sin and raise it to life and enjoyment again. Amen. Groaning, bleeding, dying for thee, the crucified one hung on the accursed tree. His voice full of mercy falls now on your ear. There is mercy for you. He will hear your weak prayer. Mm. O oh God, in the blood that for sinners doth flow, wash me, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Is that your prayer? That's my prayer. If you, want to, if you want that prayer to be yours, won't you just stand where you are? That God would wash you and he would give you that hope of eternal life. And if you're willing to say like that thief, I get it. I get it. In simple faith, you want to come to him and say, Lord, I accept you as my personal Savior. Or to rededicate yourself to him and say that I want to give my life to you and I want to be faithful to you no matter what happens. I can hang on a tree and die as a thief. But if I accept you as my personal Savior, I know eternal life is to come, and that is what I choose. If that's your prayer, I want you to just lift your hand away. Just lift your hand up. I know that's my prayer. That's my prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the simple message of that thief who speaks to us through the ages. And the simplicity but the power of his message. We accept the gift of salvation that you give to us. Even today, we rededicate ourselves, renew ourselves to you. Right now, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, there may be someone else here today who says, listen, I, I need to make a deeper commitment. I need to have prayer. I want to change things in my life. I need to do something more than dedication. Won't you come to the front? We want to pray for you. We want, you, we want to pray for you. If you want to come down and say, listen, I need prayer. I'm struggling with some issues. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking about someone else. Maybe you're praying for someone else. But you want to take this moment, this moment in God's holy Sabbath day to say, listen, I need something now. I'm coming with a burden in my heart. Won't you come to the front? Or from the choir, a young person. Maybe you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. Maybe you haven't been baptized. Maybe today, you on youth day, you want to say, listen, I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. And like that thief and simplicity, I simply want to say, Lord, remember me in my kingdom. When you come to your kingdom, young people, won't you come? You sang so beautiful today. Do you want to come and give your heart to Jesus? 
If you're not a member of the church, you want to be baptized perhaps. Maybe you're giving Bible studies or you're thinking about taking Bible studies. You want to be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Won't you come? I appeal to you today. I was baptized when I was 10 years old. I never regretted it. I ask you today, do you want to be baptized old or young, male or female, whatever your case? Won't you come? You have a special need this Sabbath day. Do you get it now? You want to take this moment? Won't you come? Just come right down quickly to the front. We want to pray for you. Anyone. The choir. Anyone. God bless you. God bless you, my sister. Anyone else? Just quickly come to the front. We want to pray for you. We want to lift you up and encircle you in prayer and ask God to give you all that you need for life of service. You say, well, how do I know if God is moving in my heart? How do I know that I should take this stand? If you feel inside of you that you need to make a commitment, take this moment to physically move and to show what's happening inside of your mind. Angels will see that. They will mark that. And they'll give you the strength to do what you need to do. Anyone else? Oh, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Is there someone else? So quickly, God bless you, my brother. Come on down. Just quickly. Just come in and stand. Just please. Complicity. God bless you. You'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. Someone That's right. else? That's right. Won't you come? Just face this way. Anyone, just come quickly. My young brother, my young sister on Youth Day. Wouldn't this be a great time for you to say that you just took a stand for Jesus? Maybe you're wrestling with some personal challenge, some trial at school. Somebody's putting pressure on you and trying to make you give up your faith. And today you've decided that I'm going to be true. I'm not going to give in. I'm going to stand tall. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give in. I get it. I get it. And you want us to pray for you to be strong. Won't you come? Someone else, quickly come. I believe there's just a few more. Just quickly come. I, I won't prolong this. But if you just feel the spirit moving in your heart, just come quickly. Just quickly come and look toward us here. Just, we want to pray for you. In a moment, I'm going to ask our pastor to, to pray for us. Won't you come, though? We want to pray for you as well. We want you to be included in that prayer. There can be confusion in your life. It was like there was confusion around the cross. No clarity. Everything was confused. People didn't have the answers right. They, they were confused. They, they were mixed up. They didn't understand. They didn't understand the prophecies. But there was one man there who had it right. He got it right. He got it. He had clarity in his mind. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> clarity in his mind. And he was willing to stand up and turn on his friend and witness for his friend on behalf of Jesus. And he said, man, why are you doing this? We deserve our plight. This man has done nothing. He was witnessing. There's someone here who will be willing to witness for Jesus. You want to stand up in your home. Maybe you have non-Christians in your home. They're not Adventists. They don't understand what you believe. And you need power to stand in that environment. Maybe it's at school or maybe at work. And you want us to pray for you. Is there someone else? Just, just come quickly. God bless you. God bless you. Quick, quickly. Come on down. Come quickly. Anyone else? Quickly. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you, my brother. Finally, my final appeal. My final appeal is this. Sometimes we, we get caught up in the 2300-day-year prophecy and uh, the book of Daniel, Revelation, powerful books. We need to study them more. But sometimes we get so immersed in it that the simplicity of the gospel is lost on us. That I am a sinner, lost in my sins. Jesus is a Savior who died for my sins. If I accept him, he will stand in for me and the righteousness that is his will become mine. And because I have accepted him... God will forgive my sins. It's all about forgiveness of sins. He'll forgive my sins, and I will be seen as righteous as Christ. That's why he could say to him, today, I'm telling you right now, you will be with me in glory, because he was receiving Christ's righteousness. If you want to commit yourself to sharing the simplicity of the gospel, won't you say amen? Amen.
Don't, don't get too complicated that you just get lost in theology. The, the theology will come. It will come. We've got to get the Bible studies, bring them out to the tent meetings and evangelistic meetings. You just had a revival in your church here, I understand. That's wonderful. But in the meantime, keep it simple. You need Jesus. You are bound for destruction. Jesus will give you glory. You may go through some trials in this life, but the better life is coming. If, if, you'll say, if you remember to do that, I want you to lift your hand where you are. Just say, listen, I want to keep it simple. Just keep it simple. Pray, Pastor, come pray for us as we end out today. Let's bow our heads, Father in heaven, O oh Lord. We thank you so much that you love us so much that you're willing to extend salvation to us even in our darkest time in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your willingness to extend your grace towards us. Lord, I pray for the individuals that have come down here to the altar today. Lord, you know why they have come. You know what's in their heart. You know the trials that they're facing. Lord, perhaps it's a greater picture of who you are, a greater faith in you that will cause them to weather whatever storm that they're experiencing in their life today. Lord, perhaps someone has come today to give their heart to you for the first time. I pray that they would receive your spirit into their hearts today that they would know today that their lives have been forever changed. Lord, I pray that as we all stand here today, we all recognize how much we need you. But Lord, today we're also standing in commitment saying, oh God, that we want to share your gospel in its simplicity with its power. And so Lord, I pray that you would give us all a picture of who you are, but you give us the courage and the boldness to share the everlasting gospel with a person that doesn't know you. And so, Lord, we just ask that you pour out your spirit upon us. May we truly be your representatives in this world. We thank you, O oh God, for what you're doing and what you're going to do and complete in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen. amen.